Hey, it's Fitz, and if you don't know who I am, here's a quick bio. I'm a veteran sports journalist who writes, does TV, radio, daily YouTube videos, and I'm a longtime podcaster. Also, I have metastatic stage 4 prostate cancer that came out of remission in January of 23. During the pandemic, my doctors advised me to stay at home, and the Life of Fitz podcast was born. My original diagnosis forecasts that I would be dead by age 60. But as I start season five of this podcast, I am 60 and still calling the many friends, athletes, coaches, colleagues, and medical advisors who I've met throughout my life. Oh, and I'm still hitting the record button and now doing so on video. Welcome to my life and the life of Fitz Podcast. Presented by the great people at Blueville Nursery in Manhattan. When I decided to move Life of Fits after four seasons of just being a podcast into the video realm, I was a little worried it would impact the conversations. Because the whole premise of the podcast was me calling friends. And I'd start with the phone ringing, which is no longer part of the show. But it apparently isn't going to phase us one bit. Connor Riley is one of those guys that is really misunderstood. I think a lot of Kansas State football fans just assumed as the offensive line coach who would yell and get after his players, he's a gruff, mean guy. Not very sociable. Couldn't be more wrong. He's absolutely a wonderful person. And I think this episode uh, will show people exactly what type of man he is. Uh, this show is such a strange mashup of doctors, coaches, former players, friends, media people. I mean, it's just people in my life, whether it's a work related thing, which is, you know, what Connor Riley is and it's grown into a friendship or, you know, someone I met because of my prostate cancer. But that's what this show is about. Just me having conversations with people, just friends talking, no beer, but there might as well be. And that's what we're about to do with Connor Riley. Hope you enjoy this. And again, I never intended for my first two guests to be right here in the studio with me, but that's what happened. Connor Riley dropped through the Cats and Dogs studio. So now let's bring him in. Here's my conversation with Kansas State offensive coordinator, Connor Riley. Thanks for joining me, coach. I appreciate it. This is fantastic. I really appreciate you having me. Just, uh, Go uh, finish up a practice, go let the dog out, and come see Fitz. Yep. <laughs> the life of a coach in June. Yeah. Yeah, let's start there. It's just gotten crazy. I mean, it, you know, uh, I've talked to Coach Kleiman about it, about, you know, I mean, all of a sudden, you need player personnel offices, and, you know, it's he's literally hiring staff that's acting as general managers. And it's crazy what's happened to college athletics. Yeah, the changes that we've seen over the years. and and the game has always changed. That's why I continue to tell people the game has always changed. And I think the drastic changes that we saw within 18 months that maybe the NCAA, maybe institutions weren't ready for, um, no one could have been ready for what happened during the pandemic of COVID. And then there shortly after you get into the transfer portal. And then shortly after, as, um, you know, cases are going up through the judicial system. Now all of a sudden you get into NIL and, the preparation or lack thereof, I think, or maybe foresight or thinking that it was a few years down the road has created a little bit of the environment that we're yeah. in right now. And it is, it's, it's hectic. And you sit there and you look at, okay, gosh, when is it time to catch your breath? And in June, um, coach was really fortunate. He gave us a few days off before Memorial day, because he said, you know, once we get back here after the holiday, guys we're going all the way up until we get a little vacation in july and and that's just what the game is right now mm -hmm. so it has changed from you know welcoming freshmen onto campus to then getting there for workouts and um you know then you have your meetings you have official visits you have maybe a midweek official visits guys don't have five official visits they can take as many as they'd like anymore. that's insane and uh it, it's really it's really just changed that scheduling um for coaches and for players alike it's uh it's nonstop. You've got the freshmen in right now or the newcomers. Yes. Um, so what can you do with them this time of year? Well, right now, um, they just began 
their workouts <laughs> with Coach True this past week. They spent, you know, kind of those first few days getting into orientation, getting their baseline testing done, um, getting physicals done, getting checked into the dorms, all of those things that are so important meetings. Um, and right now they are they are right in the mix. And Coach True, you know, he said they're going to get dropped in the grease. And I think these first two days they have been dropped in the grease. So the things that we can do with them is within some of the hours that we are allowed during the week, we can do some walkthroughs, we can do some installation meetings. Um, and then really, we cut it loose to the vets. And the vets are the ones who are running what we constitute as captain's practices. Mm -hmm. Everybody across the country does it. And it is a player run practice. And, you know, Really, we met yesterday as an offense about what our goals are. And number one is obviously staying healthy and saying that K-State is not on the schedule. Um, but building that cohesiveness, um, we really want to focus on developing great habits. Uh, and then for those younger guys, getting them into a preview of what install will be in come fall camp. Right. I'm struck by um... – I remember my going in my freshman year, I, uh, that would have been just totally overwhelming, but it seems like this generation, maybe it's social media, maybe it's everything is a little more acclimated to these things. It's, they seem older than what we were when we were 17 or 18. Yeah. It's, it's very interesting. You know, we can go back to when we first went to college or we were in high school and I often hear my friends tell us, you know, it's like, oh, these kids these days, we had two a days, we had three a days, we had this practice, we did this many things. These kids wouldn't last, you know, so long, mm -hmm. you know, in, in our day. And I actually kind of rebut that and say with what these kids have to go under with their scheduling, with social media, with maybe some of that outside pressure, the comparative society that we're in. I tell all my buddies, you guys want to last, you know, two days in the world of college football. So there is a little bit more of a maturity for mm -hmm. them. Um, I think also to your point with the the instant information that they're getting, um, they are more prepared. They're more hungry. You know, I had I had the four freshmen and they can come up and, and they can ask to meet with us anytime. And, you know, we had workouts this morning. Um, today, we didn't have a meeting. And and those four freshmen were, or four newcomers were sitting in my office and, and I had to kick them out. And one of them said, uh, you know, Hey, are you going to be up here Saturday? And I said, well, yes, in fact I am, but we have official visits coming in. So <clears throat> they're just, it's really cool because they're very eager to right. learn. But I, I agree. I recall very early in my days, you know, we had our summer conditioning. We did this, we did that, you know, maybe you had a little bit of a meeting here and there, but they are they are much more eager and much more mature um and, and really ready to kind of move forward with the next step yeah um i'll just say this i agree with everything you said but i'm i'm really glad i didn't have to go through a 1989 bill snyder workout i've heard those oh. stories I, I can i can tell you what um uh my neighbor's son was in that first bill snyder signing class and the stories that i hear I, uh, I too, am glad that uh, I was not in the formative years of what Kansas State football is right now, because I know there's a lot of blood, sweat, <laughs> and tears that were poured into getting the program to where we are today. I always, I always tell people, you just, you can't, you can't imagine how bad it was. You just can't because nobody is um, facility poor at the power level as K State was. I mean, it was just bad facilities. Every, you know, just no commitment to winning. Uh, it was a massive culture change. It's, it's the greatest coaching job, I think, in college football I, history. It's, it's crazy. And, and you look at the, the quote that is sitting right outside my door, and I paraphrase, and I'm probably going to screw it up. And for that, I apologize. But when Coach Snyder took the job and he said, the greatest turnaround in college football exists here today, yep. and we're not going to take that opportunity lightly. And yep. you look at where the football program is today, we – and Coach Kleiman acknowledges all the time we're very much indebted to the efforts of Coach Snyder, the administration, yep. the support, the assistant coaches, all the players that really laid the foundation for, for what we have today. Yep. Took them five years to get to a bowl. Not many coaches survive five years without a bowl game. So it's, interesting. it's a different era. In, in, in today's world, it, it is so much 
that it's it's the immediacy and you know we we talk about you know how how kids these days were always sitting there saying they want it they want it now they want it now and then you have to look at yourself in the mirror and set that example well as football coaches as fans as administrators you're right i don't know that you really survive you know a five-year stint of developing it and developing it the right way which is something that obviously coach snyder did and you can tell because he had sustained success yeah and and that's i think that's one of the biggest challenges that college football coaches face today is you know the moment that you have that press conference that clock starts and that clock is not a hey, you know, we can just completely reset, do all of this. And there has to be some reset. I get all of that. But, you know, three to four years, you need to start having some of that production. And and if not sooner, and you can mm -hmm. see that. And, um, and, and that's one of the biggest challenges. And what we are seeing today in college football with maybe even some of the transfer portal mm -hmm. of what's going on, of some of the things that you hear out there. And um, I always say there's there's – there's some truth in it and probably not all the way the truth, you know, there's somewhere in between, but you know, with the lack of integrity, I'll, I'll just call it the way it is of some people in, in our profession. Um, I think it comes down to that, that race that they are in mm -hmm. to, to, to go out and win. Yeah. I mean, I, I would compare it to being in uh you know, running the half mile, Mm -hmm. And instead of running harder and faster, you're elbowing guys off the track. It's just gotten so it, everyone there's cheating's always been there, but now it's yeah. just kind of it, it, awful. It, it is. And, and it's in, and, and by no means there's still so many phenomenal mentors mm -hmm. and leaders within this game. And I'm fortunate to be around so many every single day. However, you do, we all hear those stories and, and we as coaches kind of maybe hear some, some other stories that you're just in it, but it provides great example. And I tell parents all the time, you know, when we talk about integrity and character with our players that we are recruiting, those are things that I'm going to maintain. And mm -hmm. those are things that we are not going to sacrifice at any cost. And, you know, when I'm sitting down with a parent this weekend in recruiting and saying that, yes, I'm far from perfect, but I am going to do things to the best the right way right um th then that's the example that we have to set for our guys because that's that's a frustrating part is is we should be leaders for these kids and there's some people out there who may be i'll just put it cutting corners right and what kind of example is that setting for the young people on their football team right. or you know on whatever team that they're they're a part of and that's that's maybe a hard part right now speaking of leaders what makes chris Kleiman so effective as a head coach his true care yeah for other people is he's very genuine in that um and when you see some of the things happen and people talk about the business of college football which i think we all understand that is a big aspect of it um but when you see some of the decisions people may make it it, it does hit them and it hits them on a personal level mm -hmm. and i've seen that and but that's also the vulnerability that he has of building relationships with those players is why he is such a phenomenal yeah. leader. It's why, you know, it's, it's, it's one of the biggest reasons I've been fortunate enough to be around him, you know, since 2013, it's because of the type of man that he is, you know, and it's from the way that he treats my children to the way that he treats our players, the staff, the support, mm -hmm. and the way that he expects everyone else within our program to treat him that way. So, you know, he's, a, he's, he's a competitor now yeah. and, and I'm not going to sugarcoat any part of that. Uh, but just his, his deep love for his players. Um, and I'm, I'm going to say it too, is I think he's very selfless. You know, we're in a profession that the egos can, uh, they, they get pretty big. They get mm -hmm. as big as some of the stadiums. And he's a guy you're not going to ever hear say, you know, my team. And, and I shoot, I, I, I catch that lesson. You know, sometimes I'll say my own line. Well, no, it's not. It's our old line. Mm -hmm. It's our group. And uh, um, I have to catch myself. But that's something 
over the course of so many years, I've never really heard him say. I, uh, I would contend that while so many people focus on recruiting, it's important schematics offensively and defensively and how teams practice all important, but the great coaches build a culture. Yes. They built a locker room mm -hmm. and uh, I've always told people, you know, when, how are you beating Texas? How are you beating Oklahoma? And I'm like, culture, culture mm -hmm. will beat players. Yes. Um, and I'll give Sark credit. He figured it out. He mm -hmm. went in there and said, we got to fix the culture. I didn't mm -hmm. think he'd be the guy that realized that, but he did and got him going. But um, K-State's now been blessed with two guys that understand it all starts in that locker room. And you got problems in the locker room, it's going to show up on the field. Yeah. it's. I tell people all the time, the locker room is the most delicate ecosystem in the universe. It is. And you introduce just one foul piece into that locker room and you can really see the culture diminish. Mm -hmm. And, and that's something that we have got to continue to protect because it is, it's, you can look at going back to the championship in 2022. And that was a, that was a culture championship that yep. season was with many, many downs and many ups mm -hmm. and throughout the course of the year. And it was our culture that allowed us to prevail, that allowed us to, to get a stop on fourth down. It's, it's people often ask me and they're like, ah, you know, shoot. And, and, and culture is built a lot of times by the adverse situations that you face. That's, that's the thing people oftentimes forget. You know, we, we heard it all the time. Gosh, if you wouldn't have lost this game, you'd be, in the college football playoff in 2022. Well, you know, if we don't lose that game, learn the lessons, grow from it as a program, as a football team, do we win the big 12 championship? And I, I you know, obviously mm -hmm. we'll never know that, but um, the consistency that coach really shows, you know, there's not, you know, even after a tough loss, there's not a, there's not a, a an ass chewing in the locker room. Mm -hmm. There's not, it's, it's a realization of ownership, and a realization that that we need to grow and move forward and that's what culture allows right. you to do right let's spin it back to when you arrived uh how quickly did chris say you coming with me it was uh it was relatively quickly thereafter obviously we had heard the rumors um and because of the man that he is he addressed those rumors, not only with the coaching staff, he addressed mm -hmm. those rumors and the speculation that was all going on and was very upfront with the football team. And I remember like it was yesterday, uh, the day that he addressed our football team. And it was, we had just won a playoff game on Saturday and our next playoff game was against a big rival in South Dakota state. Yep. And it was on a Friday evening. So subsequently we were practicing on Sunday. And at the conclusion of that practice, um, I saw uh, Coach Kleiman coming to the middle of the field, and he was escorted with the athletic director and the deputy athletic director. And just to show the type of person he is, um, very emotionally mm -hmm. told the entire football team that he was going to take this next opportunity as an opportunity for him to continue to grow as a coach. And he was met with a standing ovation from the football team. And um, I, I, get, I, I got obviously very emotional. Um, there was hard because there were kids who were asking some questions and some questions I didn't have answers to quite for me personally mm -hmm. at that time. Um, but uh, there shortly after, uh, he did ask me to come to Kansas State and um, asked me if I need to talk to my wife, Christy. And I said, uh, uh, no, I did not. I'm joining you in Manhattan. And, uh, she could stay if she wants. She, yeah, that's right. That's right. She was excited to get here as well. But uh, um, yeah, it was uh, that was a uh, pretty awesome moment. It was a really awesome moment. And um, we were fortunate. And one of the challenges that people forget in 2019 is you didn't have the transfer portal. Mm -hmm. You didn't have, you still had only 25 initial counter scholarships. And you also were, we could not not finish what we had started at North Dakota State. No. We just couldn't. With the national championship run, the football team that we, we had at that time, we owed it to those kids. And, you know, there's an early signing date. 
and then there's a February signing date. And so it presented some challenges very early on in, in recruiting. And, and there were some recruits who are, who I'll, I'll, I'll tell you exactly. It's, they said, you know, you guys are FCS coaches. You guys right. aren't big 12 coaches. And so we had to battle a little bit of that and um, continue to find the right type of young people. And a big thing that's interesting right now is he's still a man who believes so much in development, no different than coach Knight. Nope. And, and having that belief in development um, and having a plan that you can execute is, is what coach always says. He says, I don't want to have a great football team. You know, a great football team can go, uh, you know, 11 and two. And then the next year they're at five and seven. Right. And we see those teams. He says, I want to have a great football program, a program that is consistently successful. And, and I think we have the foundation of that right now being the, you know, the only team in the big 12 over the last three years to have eight plus wins. Yep. And there's a lot that we let get away. I mean, yep. uh, I know that everybody knows that, but uh, to look at that, it's, it's a building in the right direction. Uh, you and Joe Klanderman came together, mm -hmm. came also with, coach as position coaches mm -hmm. now you're the coordinators yeah and and i don't feel like it was one of the situations where a coach is rewarding his guys mm -hmm. you guys earned it and um that's got to be kind of special though that now the very core of this group is from that north dakota state staff it's really interesting fitzy I, it was it was actually brought to my attention i was at coach clannerman's daughter's graduation and uh Joe's father was there and, you know, Joe had a, had a daughter graduate a few years ago and I was over at that graduation. We sat and BS for a little bit and, and he's probably, it's been such a whirlwind. I never even thought about it, but his dad goes, how cool is it that a couple of the guys who are original are now both coordinators. And, uh, um, I just, I feel real fortunate to have this opportunity and feel, uh, really fortunate to have this opportunity at such a phenomenal institution yeah. and to have it with such phenomenal people. And, you know, coach Klanerman and I, a lot of people don't know this. We actually played against one another in, in the old North central conference division two, he was a D lineman. I was an O lineman. So, um, where did he go? I'm he went to Mankato state. That's right. Yep. That's he's, right. he's a Mankato state Mustang or Maverick. I'm sorry. And I was a uh, Nebraska Omaha Maverick, not a, not a Mustang, but, uh, he's probably gonna give me some crap for that. But uh, yeah, so now to see us both in the positions that we are in, um, yeah, it is really cool. It is. Does his dad have obnoxiously great hair too? <laughs> I hate Joe for that hair. That's just ridiculous. The full head. Oh my god. Yes, yes, I, I do too. It's. Uh, I think Joe's maybe just a little bit older than me, and uh, um, every year mine keeps falling out. His uh, just his, gets more. It's like it gets thicker. And and you know what? He probably doesn't appreciate it enough. That's that's the thing I tell him. I hate him for it. Um, <clears throat> your promotion. Um, there was some pushback again, uh, but uh, coach gave you the opportunity of the bowl game. Yep, and um, you kind of eased everyone's tensions. Uh, brought in Matt Wells, uh, mm -hmm. you know, give you another veteran in your ear. Yep. Um, how's it going so far? It's going phenomenal. And you look at the opportunity to go in and really prove that opportunity over the course of a month against a very, very good NC State team. Yep. And a team that, just like us, really wanted to play and compete in that bowl game. And it meant something to them. So to kind of see that come full circle, uh, that was such a whirlwind. It really was because there's so many things going on in December. And it's just a crazy time. When Coach had mentioned to me that we may have the opportunity to hire Coach Wells, that put my mind so much at ease. And just in, in not really knowing him except in maybe passing, um, and then we had an opportunity to get on the telephone there shortly after the bowl game. And I think we talked for maybe three hours and just the type of person that he is. I know what his track record is. I'd followed his career from when he was at Utah state and the success that he had. Um, 
there and then obviously competing against him at Tex Tech. And and I tell him all the time that what happened to him at, at what was it, five and two, and then Bullshit. They, they lost, you know, a game to us. It was, it was, it, it was absolute BS. And just to bring his experience, to bring his knowledge and a viewpoint maybe of what we have done with our offense and how it's continued to evolve over the course of, you know, 12, 13 years, the offense is, is still very consistent with what we did as far as some terminology, mm-hmm. but just how it's evolved from, from Courtney to Colin to now myself and with the addition of, of Coach Wells and other coaches uh, that have been around. I'm just really excited about what our offense can do. Let's take a short break and hear from our sponsor, Blueville Nursery. For competitively priced landscape design, irrigation, and lawn maintenance, turn to Blueville Nursery, a family-owned business with more than 50 years of experience. You can trust the Blueville team to design and create a landscape that will accentuate your property's aesthetics. And visit our garden store six days a week for the best products in the area. From ornamental trees, shrubs, and flowers, Blueville has it all. Blueville Nursery, located on West Anderson Avenue in Manhattan, Kansas. Now, let's return to the studio. You're one of the few people that I can ask this question to, and most of the viewers won't have any clue what I'm talking about. We share a friend in Marcus Watts. <laughs> Unfortunate for us both. <laughs> Uh, when I met Matt Wells, I'm like, holy crap, he reminds me of Marcus Watts. Mm-hmm. Looks and bannerisms and speech. And I was like, what is going on here? Yep. I thought Watts was one of a kind and he's not. And no, he's not. Sadly, he's there's not. someone very similar. In fact, it's a funny story. So we went golfing myself, Wattsy, Wells, and um, and it was Brownie. And by the end of it, Wells and and Watsy were exchanging phone numbers. They're both a little bit better golfers than myself. They're exchanging, you know, you know them golfers. You know, they it's a club. They, when they when they think they're pretty damn good, then they only want to golf with other real good mm-hmm, golfers. Mm-hmm. But they're exchanging numbers to uh, set up tee times, and uh, you know, it's it's every now and again they'll let me join them. But uh, yeah, they they do have very similar mannerisms. They're both extremely competitive. Yep. Um, they. And I will mention this too. They both they give me some strokes, but uh, the last time we did go out, I think it is worth mentioning, uh, Watsy, that uh, you know, I, I, I even with the strokes, I did win that game. So uh, um, just a little reminder, just a little shot in on that. So let me, let me get this suck it, Watts. <laughs> yeah, exactly, Watsy. Uh-huh. <laughs> and, and of course, then they said they gave me too many strokes and yeah. and the whole the whole nine, but. Uh, I've just, you know, with Watts, especially as a former player and just even as a friend, um, you know, it's really cool to have a friend who has such a connection to Kansas State. Yep. But not every conversation that he and I have has to revolve around Kansas yep. State football. Yeah. And that's 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 real cool about you, Wattsy. Maybe the one redeeming quality. But, exactly. You know. So. Uh, yeah. I mean, and a beloved former player. Beloved, he just. Yes. He just put it all out there and his mm-hmm. body shows it now. Yep. And he had the most horrific injury. Well, there was one in your tenure here where I can't remember the player's name. I just totally spaced it. Helicopter yep. leg. Yeah. On the sidelines. But Watts had yeah. the worst one until then. Mm-hmm. His leg was literally sticking out to the side because he mm-hmm. dislocated the hip. It's like they couldn't get him in the ambulance. Yeah. Were, I, I couldn't know. imagine um, what that was like. Now he'll remind you of, you know, how brutal that was. And, you know, when he, you know, when he's having a bad day out on the golf course, uh, my hips bothering me. So, you know, he's still getting some mileage out of it, but uh, he is a guy, it, it's kind of interesting. You know, he told me the story about how he came in as a wide receiver mm-hmm. and how Jordy came in as a defensive back. Jordy and, stole his life. Yep. Yeah, that's, that's, he, he should be in the Green Bay Packer Hall mm-hmm. of Fame. Yes, and and not you, Jordy. You know, shame on you for doing that to Watsy. Shame on you. That is that is such a K State story, though. I mean, Watts came in as a gray shirt. Mm-hmm. I mean, he was thirty seven when he finished playing. Uh, Jordy was a walk on. <laughs> yep. Uh, and so at some point in practice, coach said, "You're on the wrong sides of the ball and switch them." Yeah. And they were both all conference players. Yeah. And who knows if they would have been any good at the other spots? Yeah. 
and, and, and you're absolutely right. And, and to me, that is like a great sign of a developmental football right. coach who sees something in a player that says, okay, hey, maybe that role, you know, isn't going to help this football team the best. And then getting that particular person to buy into that position and take the ownership of it, that's that's where your leadership comes from. And and you have stories like that. And I'm sure there's so many others mm -hmm. like that. We've had stories like that at Kansas yep. State, my tenure. Ben Sennett. And you know, you look at Ben Sennett is a walk-on. You know, I, I tell people quite often, you look at Ben Sennett as a walk-on. You know, Cooper Beebe, he, you know, I think he was a two-star defensive lineman, you know, who showed up and had 50 in his locker and was like, mm, I thought there's supposed to be 90. And then it was followed up with a text from uh, the new offensive line coach. Um, you know, you look at Felix on DK. Yep. You know, there's a picture of my phone of he and I, and I'm, I'm telling these guys, you know, who are, who are now coming to our camp, say, mm -hmm. be patient, you know, see what happens. He's 207 pounds. He was so and he didn't look anything like a college football player. No, he didn't. You know, I remember we're doing one-on-ones and, and, you know, he'll be laughing about this if he ends up hearing it, but you know, he had his right hand down and his right foot forward. You know, he'd never been really in a three point mm -hmm. stance and coach whites and they're going to, whoa, 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 whoa. And then, you know, what, two and a half years later, the guy's a first round draft pick fast, you know, and, and it's just, that is the development. That is the belief that, that so many, you know, and, and you can just, you keep going down the list, you know, Deuce Vaughn, who we absolutely love, absolutely love. And one of the best football players I've ever been around, mm -hmm. you know, one like he had 15, 20 oh, offers and too small. Yeah, yeah, that's what that's what people said. Yep, too small. And now he's playing for the Dallas Cowboys. Yep. So it's having a belief. It's finding those right types of guys. It's finding where ultimately they can fit, like a Watsy, you know, and and even you know even like Jordy, you know, and and seeing how that and and those are the stories oftentimes that get overlooked uh, in all the success that that those guys may have had, um, but how they got to that point and. And it takes it takes some really fine men and some really great leaders like mm -hmm. Coach Snyder and and who I believe in and Coach Climate. Yeah, yeah, it takes a lot of commitment from the kids. I've often said this though: when you're in Kansas, uh, and I'm, I'm imagine the same at North Dakota State. You mentioned it's a developmental program. When you're in this Midwest, Upper Midwest area, kids don't get the same opportunities they do in Texas and Florida and throughout the South. They can be outside working on their skill sets more. They uh, the rules in the high school ranks are just yep. more forgiving. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think there's an emphasis there certainly is in Kansas, but I would imagine Senate was a hockey player mm -hmm. of being multi-sport, yep. um, develop those athletic skills that may not be football skills, but mm -hmm. um, I think in this era of all this movement, if you can maintain a developmental program, it almost puts you at an advantage. Kids are bought in. I think it puts you at a huge advantage. And one of the things that you also see, because a lot of the kids in the upper Midwest, you know, you go down to maybe some of the Southern States, warmer States where they have spring football, where they mm -hmm. have all these contacts, you know, we often say what's higher, this young man's, th this young man's ceiling or this young man's floor. And the player that you may see on film right now, well, at some places you better really like what you see mm -hmm. because the improvement threshold for that player is not very much. Whereas you look at a guy who's in our program right now, Gus Hawkins, you know, you can look at Gus Hawkins who, when we offered a scholarship, I don't know that anybody knew about, and he was about 250 pounds. He's sending me then pictures of him six months prior to that where I joke with him, he kind of looked like Screech, you know, from Saved by the Bell, and I, maybe about 10 pounds heavier. Well, he weighs 294 pounds right now, and he's maintained his athleticism. He's extremely hungry. He's a guy who's played – he's played basketball. You know, he, he, he threw track for the first time. So what his ceiling is going to be as a football player is really – that's, that's – you're, you're absolutely right. Finding those types of guys – you know, they may not be ready to go year one. They may not be ready to go year two, you know, um, it, depending upon what position they're at. But you continually find guys like that. You are going to have the ability 
through that developmental phase to have consistency within that program. And, and there's, there's a bunch of stories just like that yep. that are littered up and down our roster. Yep. Um, so many programs have the luxury of recruiting a kid that looks like a college player when he's 15, mm -hmm. 16. Mm -hmm. uh, in Kansas State, we'll look at someone who's 17, 18, who doesn't look like a college player. But if you can see it, you, you develop it. Yep. And I had my own developmental uh, as a freshman. I, I came to school at 6'1", 175. <laughs> I went home for Christmas at 6'3", 225. Yes. Uh, it wasn't good weight, yeah. uh, but it was weight. <laughs> Not hitting the weight room, but hitting mm. some. Yeah, yeah. It was exactly. a it was a Domino's and beer uh, yeah. workout program. I was diligent about it. <laughs> Dedication. Yes. If you're going to do cool. something, do it. Well, I'll tell you right now. That's that. If that it couldn't be more well said. Yep. Absolutely. Um, let's let's get into some other stuff. A uh, little football here, but uh, you're probably even more excited than me about the Dublin game. Yeah, I'm, I'm two Irishmen are like, yeah. yeah, yes, I'm I am really excited about it. And it's it's so cool. It just I've never been I, I, I've never been. Um, my family members have been my sister's married to an Irish guy. They live in New York. In fact, his family wow. lives lives in, uh, I believe, Westmeath, which is, I think, 30 minutes from the stadium. Um you know, just for our players and for our fans to see the Irish culture, mm -hmm. the the welcoming, the the familiness, the just the outpouring of hospitality, and it just to see see that I think is going to be really really cool for me personally, as a guy who, you know, I grew up. Uh, you know, listening to Irish traditional music. You did. Yes. My dad and my brother played in a Irish traditional band. Well, my dad, since I can remember, you know, there's a, wow. there's a little bar in Omaha called the Dubliner pub. <clears throat> and, um, every Friday and Saturday night, not every Friday and Saturday night, but two or three weekends a year, you know, the Turfman was the name of the band, um, would be playing there. And, my brother Brendan and I would on Sunday morning have to go uh, to the Dubliner, which was underground. My old man used to say, if there was ever a fire down there, mm -hmm. no one is making it out of alive. And, you know, we go down there on, on, uh, on a Sunday morning and, and, uh, um, you know, tear down the music, break down the music. It smelled just absolutely say, awful. I was going to say Sunday you know, morning in an Irish bar. Can't be a pleasant. In, in an Irish pub. I'll, I'll say, I think the statute of limitations has expired. So I think I can say this. The first beer I ever had with my father, um, actually before he took a trip to Ireland, um, he said, I'm not going down on a plane and not having a beer with my two boys, um, was actually, uh, after we tore down music on a Sunday morning, and uh um then he came back and kind of that back bar area and brought a couple bottles of beer and we sat there for you know um well i finished my beer in about three or four minutes you know <laughs> he said i know this ain't your first so <laughs> but uh i sat back there and had a beer so it was uh and it's not just about the drinking culture everything else but from my family history um you know from the way that we celebrate right the uh, the the culture within my family, um, since the, the day I've, uh, um, since days I can remember, this is, uh, this is a really, really cool experience. I'll be honest. I, I just assumed I wasn't going to make it to Ireland. Yeah. And this, when I heard about this, I'm like this, this what? Yep. Not only do I get to go, I get to have work pay for it. Yes. That is fantastic. Yes. That it is. It is all about that. So it's, it's a whole year and a half away, you know, it was kind of cool when it came out and, you know, I, I've got, shoot, I got former players of mine asking, Hey, can you get me tickets? And, you know, I think, you know, my sister, uh, um, her family has offered for the, you know, Irish Catholic family, there's eight kids, you know, has offered for them to stay there. I don't know if they know what the hell they're getting themselves into with, with my siblings, but, uh, um, yeah, it's it's a it's a really really cool opportunity, and I'm so glad and so fortunate that we have an opportunity to do it. And you and I are gonna have a pint of the dark stuff when we yep. go there, my friend. Yep. And uh, hope I don't get in trouble over there. I'm a Fitzgerald that's Protestant. 
<laughs> you know, it's going to be a little controversial. <laughs> You'll be okay, Dublin. Right. Yeah, uh, it's going to be a no. little. You're what? Uh-huh. Um, I'm a little worried about Dublin because mm-hmm. look, we you mentioned the Irish drinking culture. We we, mm-hmm. we celebrate in the United mm-hmm. States every year. When they see Kansas City and Iowa State fans put together in their city, they're going to say these people drink too much. Yeah, they just they, they, this is no, it's <laughs> yeah. too much. Yeah. There, there's some truth in that because although the drinking culture in Ireland, to my understanding, you know they drink, they're social after work, but at about eight thirty, nine o'clock, you know everybody right. kind of clears out. I have a pretty sneaky suspicion that uh, Wildcat fans, and I'm sure you know, Iowa state fans that, uh, at eight 30 in the evening, they're not going to be ready to, uh, uh, put their head on a pillow. No, no. no. Uh-uh. So, so I think I, I'm be willing to bet Dublin can probably handle it, but, uh, the, yeah, uh, the fans of the Midwest, um, in Dublin, uh, uh they're going to probably give them a run for their money out there. I, I told the uh, Irish gentleman that came for the press conference mm-hmm. that, uh, they might want to get a couple cargo ships of Bush light, uh, going. And he just looked at me like, <laughs> What? <laughs> What's a bush light? Yeah, yeah. no, exactly. Yeah, exactly. There are so many bartenders who can go, what? Mm-hmm. Yep. It's yep. Gonna be great. I don't know if they know bush light. Now, Budweiser, though, I hear is a very, very popular beer out there. I, it's just what I've heard. So I, I'm excited to, you know what? At some point, I'm hopeful that I'll be able to find out. I know. Yep. I know. My wife's like, okay, let's go over way early and travel. And I'm like, you know, I've got to cover a football game. That's where we're going. Mm-hmm. I can't yeah. lose touch with that. Yeah. Yeah, so. there's 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 no doubt. But if you do get over there early, um, you're gonna you're gonna find a uh, just a uh, a great group of people out there who are very welcoming. She's a little too committed to seeing the what cliffs of more. The cliffs of more. Yep. I think she's plotting, Coach. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just a little shove in the back. Yeah. Well, you know what? Just ask her this. Say, you know, let me and you. Uh, pour back one pint before uh before, before she offs yeah me. before she offs you because uh if you've been to the cliff some more yeah they they may not find you yeah, i know they, they, they are, may not find you i hear it's very windy yes. so <laughs> windy and height is not going to yeah. go well with me no, no doubt um no doubt so before we start we're talking about vacationing mm-hmm. i always can judge people by how they vacation mm-hmm. um and we sound like both guys that want to go somewhere and and not do that much mm-hmm Yes. I'm on vacation. Yes. Yeah. And a little tidbit I always tell guys, you know, you got marriage advice. Uh, know how you fight mm-hmm. and know how you vacation. Yep. Those are my two pieces of advice. There's so much truth in that. If you can't get over fights, if you don't know how to solve those mm-hmm. problems, you're screwed. Yep. And if you're constantly at odds and can't compromise on vacations, because Becky's a doer. Mm-hmm. Becky's like, hey, that's a mountain. Let's walk up it. Yeah. Like, is there a bar nearby? I mean, yeah. <laughs> what's, what's my motivation? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yep. But now, now I'm, now I'm set. Mm-hmm. I, I can't do that. I have cancer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's some positives. Yeah. And even your wife yes. is like, damn it. Yeah. I can't tell him. Yeah. Like, you can't, t- she can't tell you no. Yeah. It's, it's in any opportunity. Now I tell my wife that, that and here's where her and I probably needed to have a little bit better conversation. I, my threshold is about four days. Yep. And after about four days, I start getting a little antsy. So, uh, you know, she's pushed a vacation to five days. And then, you know, she said, you're such a miserable son of a bitch to be around on that fifth day that she's kind of now at least gone to, okay, we can just do the four day vacation. Um, she knows that, uh, if we go somewhere with a beach that I'm going to go to bed early so I can get up and start reading a book and just have a little bit of peace and quiet and the, the sound of, uh, the waves oh, hitting a beach. The as I'm, it is absolutely the best. So, um, no, I'm, I'm pretty fortunate that, that her and I, um, when we do get some time together, uh, we do agree pretty often on where we're going to be going. We, uh, as I mentioned to you, we, we traveled through the South last, I think it's last summer. Mm-hmm. It all kind of runs together. Uh, when we got to Greenville, South Carolina, a wonderful place. Um, I was pretty shot. I mean, we'd done the Biltmore and all that the day before. Mm-hmm. And I, I just don't have any, I can't sustain walking. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, I was just so shot after that. And so we get to Greenville and they've got this beautiful river walk area. They mm-hmm. developed all that. And she's like, let's go look around. And I'm like, I'm going to lay down. Right. I just, I just drove here. I'm, I'm going to lay on my ass. And she's, she's gotten really good at just exploring on her yeah. own. 
Yeah. And she, she handles that. She can go out, kind of do her own thing. Yeah. And you know what? My wife is similar to that as well. There's, she's been able to join. We have that coaches convention mm -hmm. and I made the mistake of inviting her once. So now she just invites herself every year. But you know, as I'm off kind of busy doing a few different right. things throughout the day. Oh yeah. She, she can kind of wander off on her own a little bit. You know, I got to maybe steal her credit card every now and again, but I don't know if you have that issue. No, nope, I'm, uh, I'm the problem with that. Okay. I, well, I got you on that. And uh, no, so it's, it is where she can kind of go do her own exploring, as she says, her own little exploring. So, no, I'm really fortunate and, and blessed with with my wife, and we've certainly been fortunate to go on some good places. I've read some I've read some damn good books too. I don't do that often enough. I I don't either. It's uh, it's actually I, the most recent book I just read that you know if some of the coaches in our office heard this, you know, when they listen to this. Uh, um, they'll kind of laugh because I've talked to them about it so much. It's just uh, um, there's a book about the Quanta Parker and the Comanche that I finished over. So just, historical stuff? I love historical yeah. nonfiction. I absolutely love historical nonfiction. I'm constantly asking my sister <clears throat> and my brother. You know, I, I read a book, speaking of Ireland, I read a book about the Troubles. Um, and here we are, you know, the, mm -hmm. the green and the orange sitting here, you know, <laughs> as ourselves, you know, it's, it is yep. the times, it, but, uh, I do, I love, um, American history primarily. Mm -hmm. So no, it's, uh, um, if there's anyone out there listening and has a really good historical nonfiction book, um, please, uh, please don't hesitate to, uh, pass that recommendation along. So it's great. Yeah. yeah. I'm a civil war guy. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, the, the conflict was so formative of what we have today. Yep. Uh, in a world war two guy. And, yes. You know, just the, that amazing generation. It is a phenomenal generation. World war two is one that I want to continue to learn so much mm -hmm. more about. And, you know, and, and you kind of know at least some of the perspective of obviously the European campaign and the, the, the Pacific campaign of, you know, United States, but even just the involvement of other countries and how it impacted the, the outcome. And, uh, yeah, it's, I, I often say, I tell our guys to really read that history and, and, you know, as we look at it, you know, those who forget history are bound to repeat it. Mm -hmm. That's, you know? that's the absolute truth. It is. The last two books I've read, one was, um, written by Nancy Brinker who established, you know, her, her organization is the one that did all the purple or the, excuse me, pink ribbons, mm -hmm. all, all the stuff we now relate to cancer was them. Yeah. And, um, what's Susan B. Coleman, I holy space again, my memory's trash now. Uh, so that was really interesting because there's yeah. so much in that book about breast cancer mm -hmm. and the shame around breast cancer in the eighties mm -hmm. and how they fought to bring it into the public that relates now to prostate cancer because yep. dudes don't want to talk about it. Correct. I mean, having your breast lopped off was, mm -hmm. you know, traumatic for women still is yep but it was it's now i don't want to say it's culturally accepted but now we can talk about all these things in open yeah we still can't do i do but you know most guys don't want to talk about the things that go with prostate cancer no they they really <clears throat> don't and you know just a little bit of my own personal story my father was diagnosed with prostate cancer um a few years ago and uh, had some complications he's very fortunate that the cancer was more internalized into mm -hmm. the prostate, yep, but that's... had his prostate removed and, you know, and, and you've talked about it and, you know, and I hope my dad doesn't get too angry with me, but you know, he, he talked about, you know, gosh, you have your prostate and then are you, you know, do you have to wear a diaper? Do you have to, mm -hmm. you know, are you gonna, you know, piss your pants a little bit? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, but it's something that's real and it's something that's, if we don't talk about it, if we don't have the discussions about, you know, I joke with my dad, my prostate examinations got bumped up because of him, which yep. aren't necessarily pleasant, but, uh, um, you know, Moon River. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> my doc said, Hey, the nurse will be in with your cigarette here in a moment. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it was, uh, um, but it's something that's really important because yep. it is something that really if caught very early is very preventable. Absolutely. And if it's, in, it's the great thing about the prostate is it's like an egg. Mm -hmm. And if the shell isn't broken, you just throw the egg away and it's gone. Yeah. And 
and not enough people have that discussion. And unfortunately, there's some people who don't have the discussion and it impacts them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, it's so, you know, for, for my, for my father's situation, it's, it's very interesting. It was, he had, and my mom's told me this and he's told me this, you know, he had an enlarged prostate for the longest time and, um, kind of had that old school doctor that said, Oh, yep, you're fine. You're fine. You're fine. His physician retired and he got, you know, this younger, more aggressive physician and, um, went in for his prostate exam and, and they discovered cancer. And, uh, I remember the day that he called me, it was about 10 minutes before I was walking into position meetings. And, um, you know, you hear that word and not yeah. knowing a whole, here's the thing. I didn't know about it much at all. Yeah. I didn't know about what this ultimately meant. You know, I, I knew what my old man had told me mm -hmm. on the telephone and, you know, here I am, you know, I, I was in 2021 and I'm 41. So, you know, I think he can treat me like a man, but I'm still a son. And mm -hmm. so I go, well, is, is this some bit sugarcoating something here? Mm -hmm. I had to do a little bit of research on yep. it because I, I wasn't, it's not something. And then the more research that I did on it, the more I looked into it of how many men that it impacts was staggering. It was staggering. And then, you know, when I told people of my dad's diagnosis, you know, they said, well, you know, yes, this person, you know, my father-in-law, my father, you know, the amount of people. And it's just, it's true. And I, you know, maybe it's that, that, uh, that male stigma that sometimes we have that we, you know, well, we can deal with it. Well, we can deal. Well, you can deal with it till you can't. You Again, know? it's changing of generations. It is. I mean, um, by the time this goes up, I'll be returning from Vegas where mm -hmm. I'll be with four, four fraternity brothers total, three others. Mm -hmm. Um, and two of them had prostate cancer, all of us before 53. Holy 54. Shit. Yeah. Wow. So, um, it's probably related to some of the shit we did in college, but anyhow, um, there's no science behind that folks. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, assumptions. But you know, you mentioned the doctors and, and again, I go back to the, the breast cancer situation in the 1980s. Doctors were like, what do you mean? Self-exam? No, 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 no. And now I still, I see this with prostate cancer. Oh, we don't need to check that till 55. Yep. Mm -hmm. and because of that, I almost died. Mm -hmm. you no, know, it's it seems to be creeping younger and younger. Matt Miller, former K State quarterback, died at forty nine. Yeah, and it was ravaged by it. And it's unfortunate. And it was it was interesting in talking with my own physician. You know, he said there was a period of time that they said they weren't doing the PSA. They didn't need to. They could find it other ways. And he said I always had continued to do it. Mm -hmm. um, this was my own personal per, uh, uh, physician. Um, and he said that in that period of time, and, and for whatever reason, I don't know, you know, insurance, I don't know, but that there was a higher mortality rate relative to prostate cancer. Yep. And I think what I've been told is that they are now being more aggressive mm -hmm. with testing. Um, but uh, uh, it's, it's, you know, for those listening, I'm sure they know it's not very pleasant, um, but it's really it's really a necessity. And because it is something that you say, if you can catch early, mm -hmm. you know, what is the quality of life? Well, how are you going to be doing that? And it's it's something that that should be talked about a little bit more. And I'm not I'm not embarrassed. I, I joke sure. a little bit about it. And, uh, you know, but I was, you know, Fitzy and, and you and I talked about a little bit, but when my dad was diagnosed, I was scared out of my mind. Yep. Just absolutely scared out of my mind. And, and he's, he's, he's an older gentleman, you know, he's in his, he's in his seventies, um, when he was diagnosed, um, and, uh, had to have his prostate removed, had a scary, scary situation where, um, we almost lost him just because, um, he got an infection, um, mm -hmm. from an enlarged prostate that, uh, um, uh, went into septic shock wow. and, you know, when they went in for, uh, the surgery to remove the prostate, uh, you know, you gotta get your heart checked and mm -hmm. everything else. And doc looked at him and looked at his medical records and go, you survived that. Hell yes. This, this surgery is going to be a breeze, you know, and it's all, 
based on that, you, you, you wonder, and see for, for mine is, is, was my dad very fortunate that his previous physician retired and a great physician it's, I'm not casting any dispersions. I'm not saying this or that. And then, um, how lucky that, uh, that he got this new physician that yep. he goes, you know, she's a gunner. Yep. And, uh, and he's still, you know, he's up in Omaha and, um, he's actually, uh, um, probably, uh, eating dinner with my kids right now. Awesome. Yeah. It's awesome. Coach, this has been fun. This has been a blast. I, I, uh, didn't know we were going to go so much into that, but mm-hmm. I'm, and I'm sorry if I, if no, I no, I love it. I, 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 can I think talk it's about important. it all. It's, it, I, I'm, I literally vowed uh, when I started to learn about prostate cancer, because again, mm-hmm. I didn't even know what a PSA score was, mm-hmm. um, that, um, and you know, I started off stage three, it, they knew it was kind of out of the shell a little bit, yeah. Uh, but not until we just talked about it last episode of Doc Rosso, not until they got into the field, did he see how bad it was and how, how aggressive this was. I think he's told me once it's the meanest cancer I've ever seen. Yeah. Um, and, um, he said it just looked evil and he knew I, he knew right then I was in for a fight cause it already yeah. got in my bladder and, and I decided early on, I'm going to be an open book because if mm-hmm. this shit's going to take me, I'm going to save some brothers along the way. Yeah. I'm done. I, we got to get over the shame of it. You know, yeah. I, I'll tell people about erectile dysfunction and yes, mm-hmm. I'm sitting here. We're in an adult under yeah. garment, you know, it's just the way, way, um, life is. Yeah. And I'll, I'll be, you know, it's like, a guy in a wheelchair yeah, isn't ashamed to talk about his legs don't work. Yep. And that's, that's the way I am. Mm-hmm. Uh, although uh, my, uh, I'm basically in menopause. Uh, I get hot flashes. And uh, uh, if I, if I sneeze, I wet myself. <laughs> so it's just, it's lovely. It's, I, I'll tell you, and I'm, I'm, I'm laughing as you bring some levity to it, but it is e- even you talking about your experiences and, and the timeline not being much different than, um, what my father's diagnosis was and, and absolutely shedding some light on something that now, you know, the, the you know, I don't want to have this done because then it's this, then it's that. And, and, and I know that's, that's part of it and those are real, but, uh, uh, so is everything that, that you got ahead of you too. Yep. And, you know, tip my hat to not only the type of fighter that you are, how you attack this, but then the awareness that you do bring. Um, I, I think it, it says a whole hell of a lot about you. And, uh, well, you'll appreciate this. Uh, being an Irishman at heart, uh, I'm ready to fight, and it's probably not the first time I've watched myself. <laughs> That's it. We'll talk to you Love next it. week on the Life of Fitz. Thanks, Coach. I appreciate I it. I so appreciate much. you so much. You I really do. This has been nice. Thank you. Thank you. Coach is fantastic. Um, just a wonderful guy. Uh, and I hope you got to know him a little bit better, whether you're a K-State fan or not. Uh, getting to know people and what they're really about is, is kind of, there's value in it. Someone after that first episode I did with Dr. Philippe Rosso, it's like, this was really cool. Because the whole idea here isn't to have an interview, it's to have a conversation. It's something I tell young journalism students. Don't go have an interview with someone, try to just talk to them. And that's how you get the best stuff. So I want to have conversations about life with people I know, sometimes people I don't know. And that's what Life of Fitz is all about. It's about life and the amazing people you meet along the way. We'll talk to you next week with another episode of Life of Fitz. I have no idea who it's going to be with because I'm heading to Vegas. I'll worry about that next week. Take care, everyone. I'll talk to you real soon. I appreciate you listening to this week's edition of Life of Fitz. And thank you to all the great people at Blueville Nursery for sponsoring our show. This has been a Spirit Street production.